everyone. Today is Constitution Day. 225 years ago today in Philadelphia, the Founding Fathers approved our Constitution after five grueling months. The U.S. Constitution is the oldest operating written government charter in the world. This is why we are gathered here today. The architect of the U.S. Constitution, James Madison, came up with the design of checks and balances, the separation of powers, and fe- Well, Mr. Madison, Mr. President, we are just about to explore one of the constitutional cases dealing with the meaning of the document that you drafted. It's the summer of 1901. In the bustling streets of Utica, Joseph Lochner is struggling to keep his bakery doors open against the larger monopolizing bakeries. Within his shop, in a discussion with his employee, Amon Schmitter, Joseph Lochner is discussing the fine he received. I do not understand this Bakery Shop Act. I started this business when I first came to the United States and made it into what it is today. I've had issues in the past, but nothing this serious. I cannot believe I was fined and arrested for simply allowing you to work. What is the fine for? It says that the fine is for allowing you to work for more than 10 hours a day. As long as I agree to work more than 10 hours a day, I see no reason why you should be fined. I do not understand this whole ordeal. The fact is that I like to work to support my family. In my opinion, this entire issue is caused by the larger bakeries trying to drive us out of business. This legislation raises costs too high for us to compete. We need these long shifts to keep our ovens going and producing bread. Without them, we will have to close up shop. I have worked too hard and long to close up shop now. I will not allow them to tell me how to run my bakery. I'm going to talk to an attorney and fight this fine. Following his conviction, Joseph Lochner is discussing grounds of appeal with his attorneys, Mr. Wiseman and Mr. Field. Are we planning to challenge this decision? Well, based on Allgaier versus Louisiana, I believe you should have won in the first place. We are going to appeal this decision to a higher court. Of course we're going to challenge this. Doesn't the Yagar case allow me to negotiate with my employee how long to work? Yes. It's called the liberty of contract. You have the freedom to make any agreement with your employee that you wish. Correct. In Algar v. Louisiana, the United States Supreme Court struck down a statute that limited the uh, insurance policies in Louisiana. This law violated the citizens' constitutional rights. Now, where does this liberty of contract come from? It comes from the 14th Amendment of the Federal Constitution. Justice Peckham wrote in his decent, uh, opinion of that case, the liberty mentioned in the 14th Amendment means not only the right of the citizen to be free from the mere physical restraint of his person as by incarceration, but the term is deemed to embrace the right of the citizen to be free in the enjoyment of all its faculties, to be free to use them in all lawful ways, to live and work where he will, to earn his livelihood by any lawful calling, to pursue any livelihood or avocation, and for that purpose to enter into all contracts which may be proper, necessary, and essential to his carrying out to be a successful conclusion the purposes above mentioned. If I remember correctly, Justice Peckham is still on the court. Hopefully that will help my chances. It should. I'll file the appeal right away. In the justices' conference room, the justices are gathering over the briefs filed by Lochner's attorney and the Attorney General of New York, who is responsible for prosecuting Lochner for his crime. Justice White, I'm doing well, thank you. Please, let us all take our seats. in front of you is number 292, Lochner versus New York. Justice Day, please tell us what the appellate brief states. Lochner's attorney states that this statute denies specific people in the banking industry equal protection of the laws. Well, if this is the case, then a change is needed. <coughs> Justice Holmes, please tell us what the appellate brief states. Julius M. Mayer, New York's attorney general, says it is within the right of the state to regulate the number of hours worked a day to protect the citizens' health. 
I do not see any health issues with the banking trade. I suggest we hear this case. I think the contrary, Justice Brewer. In fact, Professor Hurt in his Disease of the Workers has found large amounts of health issues within the baking trade. Wait, well, hey, that may be, but the Due Process Clause does protect the liberty of contract. We should put this liberty of contract idea to rest. I cannot find it anywhere in the 14th Amendment. There you go again, Oliver. It sounds like this is not a clear-cut case. We will vote to grant a writ of certiorari to hear it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Then it is decided that we will hear Lochner versus New York. On February 23, 1905, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments for Lochner versus New York. Oye, oye, order in the court. The oral arguments are first given by the appellant, which is Lochner, and then the appellee, or the Attorney General of New York, followed by questions from the justices. Now we will hear number 292, Lochner versus New York. May it please the court. The Bakery Shop Act denies specific people in the baking market the equal protection of the law. This piece of legislation does not equally affect the baking industry. There is only a small portion of the baking trade that is affected by this statute, which my client is a part. The Constitution says that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The statute in question is not a reasonable exercise of the police power, neither from the trade nor the connection with the 14th Amendment. Doesn't the police power come into play when the actions of one citizen affect the health and safety of another? First of all, in a first class bakery, there is no danger to an employee. In continuation to your question, there are already other laws in which sanitary conditions are addressed. When a statute is enacted in order to secure the public comfort, welfare, or safety, then it must be adapted for that reason. The stipulation is that it cannot invade the rights of persons or property under the authority of the police power regulation. There is a fundamental right to pursue occupations. In the following states, this type of legislation has already been declared invalid. Massachusetts, Illinois, California, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Arkansas, and Nebraska. Thank you, Counselor. You may sit down. Mr. Mayor, Attorney General of New York, you may approach. This statute is most certainly a police power of the state. According to Holden versus Hardy, if, the, if it is not the proper use of the police power by the state, then the injured party must be the person to challenge it. The state has the power to protect its citizens against its own ignorance of laws or safety concerns. During these long durations of work, it is not possible for these able-bodied men to work without harm. The unhealthy aspects of a baker were fully commented on by Judge Van in his opinion in the Court of Appeals. The propriety of its exercise within constitutional limits is purely a matter of legislative discretion with which courts cannot interfere. Counselor, New York is the first state to enact this sort of bakery regulation. Why should we interfere with the right to purchase and sell labor? This is a concern we have already expressed in other cases, such as Allgaier from other states. The pieces of legislation in those states were for different occupations, not the one that is at hand today. Thank you, Counselor. You may sit down. Well, Mr. Madison, the justices are deliberating. What do you think of this case? Well, my main concern was the role of factions dominating the American political system and the role that each should play in legislation such as this. What's the issue regarding factions? In Federalist Papers numbers 10 and 51, I illustrated the dangers of factions. In a large nation, many different interests are constantly in flux for more power and influence. The only way to truly check that one interest or faction does not become too powerful is to check faction with faction. A system of checks and balances is needed to keep these interests at bay. That is why the other founding fathers and I decided on a three-branch government. Each branch is used to check one of the other branches. We are, we are seeing this constitutional system at its finest in this case. So why do we need checks and balances at all? Well, that is a very interesting question, and I'm glad that you asked. Let me put it this way. If angels were to govern men, then neither external nor internal controls of government would be necessary. However, this is not the case. 
the tendency of all men and branches of government is to increase their power. When my old friend Alexander Hamilton, which he would not want me to call him old, was describing the interworkings of the three branches of government, he described the legislative branch as having the power of the purse. Now, by this statement, he meant that the legislative branch controls the money and the laws. He described the executive branch as having the power of the sword and the authority to dispense honors. The last and final branch was the judicial. He described this branch as not having the power of the purse or the sword, but the power of judgment. We are seeing this power here today. So would you say that the judicial branch is the weakest of these branches? Back in 1787, <laughs> I would have answered yes. However, it seems as though the judicial is not the weakest branch and now holds the power to dictate the types of laws that can be passed by the legislative branch and enforced by the executive branch at both the state and federal levels of government. So you're telling me that the Founding Fathers saw these issues that long ago? My dear madam, it has only been 118 years. Oh, only 118 years. I apologize. Apology accepted. Sir, can I ask you one more question? You may. How do you think that the justices will rule on this case? This case is very difficult to predict. I do not know how the justices will rule, but I do know that it will be very close. I trust your judgment. In school, I remember reading a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville, and he said that all American political questions somehow end up in the American courts. <laughs> I guess that's what we're witnessing here today. I believe the justices are about to rule. Let's adjourn and direct our focus back to the court. Today is April 17th, 1905. It has been close to two months since the oral arguments. After much debate and deliberation, the justices have ruled and will present their opinions. The nation awaits this ruling. This ruling could effectively alter the nation's history for over a hundred years. You may. The court has ruled in a five to four decision to strike down the Baker Shop Act. The following opinions read by Justice Peckham, Justice Harlan, and Justice Holmes will discuss the grounds for this decision. Justice Peckham. According to the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, no state can deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The right for an employer and employee to agree upon the amount of time the employee will labor is protected by this. Unless certain circumstances exist, allowing the state to limit that right. In those instances, the circumstances must relate to the safety, health, morals, and general welfare of the public. This court has oftentimes upheld the right of states to prevent individuals from making certain kinds of contracts. If the state's intervention reasonably relates to the safety, health, morals, and general welfare of the public, then the state statute is valid and there is no prohibition against it. It has been argued before this court that the right of bakers and their employees to work beyond the hours mandated in the statute is substantially unhealthy. If this were the case, the statute would be valid. However, we think that there can be no fair doubt that the trade of a baker in and of itself is not an unhealthy one to that extent which would authorize the legislature to interfere with the right to labor and with the right to free contract on the part of the individual, either as employer or as employee. We think that the state's right to legislate in this case has been reached and passed. There is no reasonable foundation for the state of New York to limit the hours worked by bakers and their employees. The act is not within any fair meaning of the term a health law, but an illegal interference with the rights of individuals 
both employers and employees to make contracts regarding labor upon such terms as they may think best or to which they may agree upon together. Given that New York has no real ground on which to justify their statute as protecting the health of its citizens, the law interferes with the liberty of contract protected by the 14th Amendment. The judgment of the Court of Appeals of New York, as well as that of the Supreme Court and of the County Court of Oneida County, must be reversed and remanded. Justice Harlan. Granting that liberty of contract is grounded in the 14th Amendment's due process clause, liberty of contract, like all constitutional rights, is subject to regulations as the state may reasonably prescribe for the common good and the well-being of society. Whether or not this be wise le legislation, it is not the province of the court to inquire. I find it impossible, in view of common experience, to say that there is no real or substantial relation between the means employed by the state and the end sought to be accomplished by its legislation. As Professor Hurd states in his treatise, Disease of the Workers, the labor of bakers is among the hardest and most laborious imaginable because it has to be performed under conditions injurious to the health of those engaged in it. Inhaling of flour inflames the lungs and bronchial tubes. Eyes suffer from dust. Long hours of toil subject bakers to rheumatism, cramps, and swollen legs. The intense heat in workshops induces the workers to resort to cooling drinks. Another writer notes, nearly all bakers are pale-faced and of more delicate health than the workers of other crafts. During periods of epidemic diseases, the bakers are generally the first to succumb to death. Voiding the New York statute seriously cripples the inherent power of the state to care for the lives, health, and well-being of its citizens. As I wrote in my majority opinion, upholding Kansas's statute, limiting labor, contracts on public works to eight hours a day, legislative enactments should be recognized and enforced by courts as embodying the will of the people unless they are plainly and palpably beyond all question in violation of the fundamental law of the Constitution. Justice Holmes. The issues in this case were decided according to an economic theory in which most of the country does not agree. Some of these laws embody convictions or prejudices which judges are likely to share. Others may not. But a constitution is not intended to embody a particular economic theory. The 14th Amendment does not enact Herbert Spencer's social status. This court has showed many examples of having the safety and interests of the citizens in mind. When this court upheld the Massachusetts vaccination law in Jacobson versus Massachusetts this year, we showed our deepest concern for the well-being of the country. Our endearing concern can yet be seen again in Holden versus Hardy. The upholding of the statute, which allowed minors to work for eight hours, was both in the interest of the employer and the employee. After eight hours of work in a dangerous occupation, the citizens of the community and the parties of the contract are at danger. Some of the beliefs of this court have been apparent in rulings and in their opinions. However, general propositions do not decide concrete cases. The decision will depend on a judgment or intuition more subtle than any articulate major premise. Every judgment, every opinion tends to become a law. However, these laws are passed through the system in which our founding fathers have laid before us. With our system, the opinion of the majority would be represented. I thereby believe that this judgment should be affirmed. Joseph Lochner, Amon Schmitter, and Henry Wiseman are conversing about the decision and the future of their business. I certainly enjoyed hearing the opinion yesterday, but Mr. Wiseman, I honestly don't have much of an idea what it means for Amon and myself. 
the decision was reversed and the statute was struck down. In other words, the law that was going to restrict the number of hours that a single person could work in a day will not take effect. By it being reversed, the entire law will not take effect. You and Mr. Schmitter also have the freedom to make a contract as long as both of you honor it. So I can still work the hours that I want? Absolutely. With this decision, similar legislation will be difficult to be passed. This decision not only affects the present, but the future as well. I am just relieved I'm able to keep running my bakery. All I ever wanted was to run and operate the shop. Thank you for your help, Mr. Wiseman. You can have fresh bread anytime you wish. No need to thank me for my help. Mr. Field and I were merely fighting for what is right. I may take you up on that fresh bread, though. I hear your bread is some of the finest. I appreciate the compliment. Please pass my thanks on to Mr. Field when you see him. I most certainly will. Farewell. Well, Amon, I think we should go bake some of Mr. F Wiseman's and Mr. Field's favorite bread and send it to their homes. I was thinking exactly the same thing. It will show our gratitude. Let us make bread together. I love the sound of those words. Well, Mr. President, when you were Secretary of State, John Marshall said in Marbury versus Madison, it is emphatically the province and duty of the Judicial Department to say what the law is. And now Justice Peckham says that this act violates the liberty of contract grounded in the 14th Amendment. For decades in the so-called Lochner era, the Supreme Court regularly struck down economic regulations just like this one. The Supreme Court even struck down the New Deal statutes only to change its mind a few years later under intense political pressure. Alexis de Tocqueville described the American legal system best when he said, there is hardly a political question that does not sooner or later turn into a judicial one. We knew in Philadelphia that power would check power. Here, state legislative power was checked by the federal judiciary. Although a good amount of people, including President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, criticized the courts for interfering with the democratic process, the courts continued to exercise their power of judgment that Hamilton wrote about in Federalist Paper Number 78, in which he wrote, the judiciary, on the contrary, has no influence over either the sword or the purse. It may truly be said that neither force nor will, but merely judgment. Whenever I was troubled by a Supreme Court ruling, there were words from Philadelphia which have always brought me solace. We the people. The key to fixing any of the constitutional issues in this country is simple. Just ask the people.